Welcome to another episode of the Property Nomads podcast. And today, uh, delighted to be joined by Mark Champ of Wharf Financial Services. And we're going to be deep diving into how customers can help themselves in terms of presenting themselves to uh, financial institutions in order to help to get deals through. Uh, Mark kindly requested that he introduce himself a bit more in depth. So, Mark, uh, I'll leave you with your own introduction. Thanks a lot, Robert. It's um, great to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me on here. Um, it's it's an interesting topic about um, how to to help customers help themselves. So hopefully, um, as we go into this, um, we, can, we can give some nuggets of information. Uh, but my background, I um, I'm a uh, property finance broker. We like to think ourselves as a specialist property finance brokerage, where we we do vanilla deals, but we seem to add value where it's a bit difficult. So if there's a, a strange structure in the background or it's um, something just not not quite vanilla. Um, so that that's what we do. We, we've we been um, a brokerage for six months now. Um, it's probably actually seven months as we've moved into November. We are a team of five people. We've got myself, um, who is a broker, and I manage the team. We've got three other brokers, um, and we've got a client relationship manager as well. So we're we're a relatively new brokerage, but we've got a tremendous amount of experience. I've been in banking for 16 years before I became a broker around three years ago. Um, We've got... Uh, another member of the team who was uh, a, a relationship director at Lloyd's and had a career there for 41 years, so longer than I've been alive. Uh, and we've got two other two other guys, one who was in a high street bank and another that was in one of the challenger banks. So we've got a, a vast array of experience and hopefully going forward, we, we can help more and more customers and really um, promote what we're doing. And in terms of sort of exploring the topic that you, you just mentioned there about how customers can help themselves. It, I always say it's, uh, oh, what's the Chinese philosophy? Uh, the guanqi, I think, philosophy. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And then those people mm-hmm. who you do know can help guide you. Because, I mean, there's, you know, the world of finance is, you know, can be good fun, I imagine. But you know, sometimes for regular investors or even experienced professionals, it can be, um, a bit of uh, a bit tiresome because of all these different rules and whatnot. But you're going to shed some light on that today about how people can help themselves. Yeah, definitely. It, it can be daunting for a customer. I know when I was buying my first house, just trying to get the right solicitor, um, getting all your finances in order, and it, it's been made so much more difficult for the the average person on the street to get finance because rules and regulations have come in. And these rules and regulations are very necessary. The the PRA and the FCA bring in these rules to protect people. They're not brought in to get in people's way. They're brought in to make sure the industry functions correctly and there's, there's no fraud and there's a level of responsibility um, that the lenders need to go through to make sure that they're, they're lending responsibly and there aren't any you know big crashes along the way so it's very important that you know my, my first thing to really mention is about having what some people call a power team around you making sure you have a, a solicitor an accountant um, a broker and professionals in the the, the right field to it really does help if they know each other as well. So somebody who's experienced would generally know most of the solicitors out there who deal with the lenders and most of the accountants who who are uh, who deal with the lenders. So the communication channels between broker, lender, solicitor, accountant are fundamental to any transaction going well. Because it's if you if you think just about a normal transaction, a normal transaction will last three months in a property investment sphere at the, probably at the very least we've we, you know some of them go on for a year at a time they they really do and if you think about a development deal as well you're in bed with that lender that solicitor that accountant for a long time you know a, a transaction will take 18 months for a development to to finally 
finish and the, the, the building to be built. So it's important that you know who you're getting in bed with for the long term, not just a quick, cheap, easy option. You need to know that there's going to be a relationship and that when something does go wrong, you can pick up the phone, you can talk to these people and they've got the experience and the ability to talk to each other. Yeah, having having a having a power team is, is crucial. I, I must admit, I've never thought too much about them knowing each other. So I, th- I guess that Aaron and myself, we've sort of not forced the relationship, but we've kind of got the broker and the solicitor to get to know each other over time. So we've kind of forged the relationship over time. But I get what you're saying. I think that's a really good point of view, especially if people are, are starting. If you've got that congruency, uh, as you mm-hmm. say, that, that's one way that that could help facilitate things moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And any good broker, any good solicitor will get to know each other and they will make it work. But it, it does help. I've got a case that's going on at the moment and there's a, a little bit of a, a problem that's come up at the end. And I know the, the solicitor really well. So I picked up the phone to her and said, you know, this, this has happened. Can you sort it out? And I'm not saying all my stuff goes to the top of the pile, but it it sometimes does. So <laughs> it really uh, <laughs> it really does help when you know them and you can get action taken quickly. And uh, there's also gatekeepers when when you've got uh, you're trying to get through to a solicitor. You solicitors often do have secretaries who field their calls, and if you have a gatekeeper in the way, it can make it difficult. So knowing who you're dealing with and making sure that that solicitor has dealt with that lender in the past as well because lenders have different ways of working and even though there's all these fca and pra guidelines that the lenders should abide by they have different interpretations and i was on a a call with some of my uh, industry peers yesterday and we were talking about the c-bills loan and how the C-bills loan came out and the government weren't very um, prescriptive in how the C-bills loan should be used and what the criteria definitely was. So lenders had to use their own lending criteria and almost forge what they thought the right way forward was with it. So making sure a lender and the solicitor both know each other's game, if you will, is really important because each lender has a different set of circumstances and a, uh, and what their criteria and thought processes will be. So that's not like the government to be a bit laissez-faire on uh, those sort of things either, is it? Well, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, C-bills, in essence, replaced what's known as an EFG, an Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme, um, that came about probably around 10 years ago now. It's when I was at at Lloyd's, I think. And EFG was had definitive rules and regulations in what you could or couldn't do. C-bills has been left to interpretation a bit more, which has been good in some ways, but in other ways, it's not been so good because the, the lenders have had to try and get their head around it and make sure they're lending responsibly and in the right um uh, the the right way to customers using this new guarantee scheme and the new bit payment the um business interruption payment i had to think what the acronym stood for there um so it's, it's really important that everybody knows what's going on and being able to translate lender speak into solicitor speak into customer speak is something that is really important for i feel for a customer to to really consider when they're choosing their team i think think that's a great opening point and just um sort of slightly off topic uh sort of dispel a myth that yeah i do a little bit of reading out about there and some people seem to have this uh, ideology that you've got a property you know a vanilla buy to let for example and some again every finance company is different but some people seem to get very frustrated at the amount of questions and queries you know that finance companies give and it's like well surely you want to lend because you're going to 
you know, make your money on it. But why so many yeah. questions? I mean, what, why is that? Is that a backlash from the financial crash of, you know, 08, et cetera? Or, or is that just the nature of, of lenders? What's, what are your thoughts on that, Mark? It's, it's an interesting question because not every lender has the same questions. And a high street lenders have a set of questions to say, Challenger Bank. Challenger Bank will have a different set of questions to a bridging lender. If it's a bank, and that can be a Challenger or a high street bank, they're generally governed by the PRA. So they have a, they have to follow. So um, proving where deposits have come from and, and things like that, source of wealth. In my opinion, every lender should be asking those questions anyway. Some don't, um, and it makes it easier for the customer from a getting your loan over the line and into the into the system. But I think there's too many questions being asked. I think they have to just take a step back and say, why are they asking these questions? They're asking these questions because they want to lend responsibly. Don't it to happen that, you know, interest rates shoot up to six, seven percent, whatever it may be, and they're in trouble. They don't want to have uh, find out later on down the line that they've actually borrowed their deposit from an investor who's charging them one percent a month. Because these sorts of questions find out exactly what the exposure, what the experience and how the customer may act in the future. So I think these types of questions are very important. And I think people just need to take a step back and think, why are these questions being asked? They're not being done to annoy people. They're being done to cars and vendors. Mm, that, does, that does make a lot of sense. I, I think, uh, as with many things, there's always two ways of looking at everything aren't there so yeah, it's just interesting to get a, a point of view from yourself there so we discussed power team and why that's important give us another couple of things that customers can do to, to help themselves when it comes to uh, approaching finance they're applying for finance on one day and then applying for that finance make sure if you are thinking about applying for finance you've prepared for your application so when a, a lender gets their uh, application in, they'll look through bank statements, they'll look through tax returns, they'll look through whatever information that they request. The worst thing a, a, a lender can see on a bank statement is, you know, an overdrawn position that is always overdrawn. Um, they don't want to be seeing defaults and um, lots of, strange things going on in the accounts because these put lenders off um you know if, you, if you've got missed payments on your credit report and things like that it makes it harder for a lender to say yes so a tip is to if you are thinking about investing in property or you're doing a, another investment in the, the future think about how it's going to look to lenders you'll be looking at, they'll be looking at the, the bank statements for the last three months. Um, they'll be looking at your tax returns probably for the last two years as well. They'll be making sure that you've got no defaults, even if it be on a mobile phone or whatever it may be. Because in the moment, in the current climate, lenders don't like adverse. They don't want to lend to people who have got adverse credit. So it's, in, it's essential that you've got your your house in order early on. Uh, just on that, if, for example, again, I've heard stories where people have known they've missed a payment for something and something that might not have been their fault, but they know it's on their report. And I think some people go in blind because they almost think that, oh, the lender won't pick up on it, but of course they will. So they will. if something like that has happened, that's in, it's imperative to tell your broker straight away that it's happened yes. and why it's happened. Is that correct? Yeah. So I've got one at the moment that is not a fault of the customer at all. The, the customer had been uh, applying for uh, some finance for a, a property that they refurbed and was mo were moving on to a buy-to-let. 
unfortunately, when we did the, the credit search, we found there was a there was a default for a very, very small amount of money. But the funding line in the background from the lender, so the people that give the lender money to then lend to the customer, had put a condition that they would not lend to anybody who had any adverse. Therefore, there from the lender to the customer is a blanket, no, we cannot help. This customer had had a fraudulent uh, payment put through their account. So it's no fault whatsoever. But I think that just highlights you should get a credit report done for yourself so you can see what is going on in the background before you even go to a broker. You know, it's not difficult. You can go on Experian, you can do a 30-day free trial, uh, but make sure you cancel that um, unless you want to keep with the Experian for the long term. Um, you can you can get these and you can see your credit report. You can see what's going on in the background because a broker will love you if you've done their job for them. If, you, if you've done their job and package it so that they can then just send it off to a lender, it makes it so much more easier for a broker and it makes it so much more easy for a lender. Organisation is key and preempting what is going to be asked for. Yeah, I've, I've definitely learned that over time uh, from the various sort of buy to lets. The first couple were very rocky. You know, you're sort of you're breaking your property virginity, and you know you're not quite sure what's going to happen. But now, yeah, whenever we put in uh, for a new purchase or a refinance, it's you know what tenants in there here's the AST, here's everything you need to know, this is what's going on, here's the bank statements, here's SA302, the whole lot. And then, uh, yeah, I think our broker quite likes us for that. But yeah, we've learned that over time, as you say, because it's all about asking questions and, and figuring this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really important. It's, it's very important you do have your house in order and that you can present things that a lender wants. Because one other thing people probably don't realise is lenders have SLAs. And these SLAs are... When a question gets asked, you, the, the lender goes to the broker and says, right, um, there is an entry on the bank statement that shows X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me about this? And then the broker goes away to the customer. The customer takes a day to you know, get the email because they don't check their emails all the time, and they then come back with the information. When that information goes back to the lender, the lender's SLA will start. So they've got a certain amount of time to look at that that query some lenders at uh, certain points were up at you know four days maybe eight days and it starts again and what lenders have done in the past is they have a sla that they you know they meet but then another question arises and then another question arises and it keeps going and these slas get reset every time so on the the dashboard for the for the lender you could have everything looking green, i.e. they've responded in the timescales they're supposed to, but because there are lots of different SLAs, it takes a long time. So they're almost playing the game, really. And, it, it, you know, if you get the information there up front, you don't have these delays. Mm, too true. A bit, bit of in, uh, internal knowledge. <laughs> well, th that's what it's all about, because you know, this sort of information is key and crucial, because... As you said, as a, as a you know broker and someone that works in finance, you want your life to be easier whilst providing the best value to your customers. And you know a lot of the time that is by providing the customers the knowledge to say, hey, this is how I want you to do it, because then it's going to make everyone's job easier. And you know you're going to get your properties, hopefully, you know quicker. Um, fingers crossed, anyway. So yeah, quicker, and you're not over borrowing or yeah. anything like that. Ma making sure that you're doing it sensibly on both counts, making sure, you know, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. It's, it's really important because property is a long-term game. You know, it's not it's not a short-term investment. So you need to make sure that everything's working today so it can work in, you know, 25 years when you're going to realise your profit or whenever it may be. Too true. I totally, I totally agree on that. So be prepared for your application. So point number two, that's great. So if we, if you had to give a, a third key point, then what would that be? How can people help themselves even more? Just trying to think. Um, do your research on the, um, the the property 
and the area. There are a lot of people who, who will just go to an estate agent and say, what do you think my or this property is going to be worth? The estate agent wants you to put it on the market with them. You know, they, they're going to give you, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, and I, I did it. I had my property valued recently. And he gave me three values. And I obviously took the highest value. And, you know, probably not the most sensible thing to do. But you need to do your research. You need to get on Zoopla, see what things have sold for. Not what Zoopla guesses at what they're worth. You, they've, they've probably got a good algorithm in the background, you know, but you need to have to see, you see what it's sold for. On a, on a road, there's always a sea, house price ceiling. So make sure you're not going above what the property that sold them for the most on that road is because realistically, you're probably not going to have the best house on the road. You're, it's not going to be head and shoulders above, you know, unless you're on a some strange road. But... Um, it's it's important that you do your research. You, you talk to agents, get a feel for how the market is, but every agent will always tell you that the market's brilliant and we're selling loads and, you know, there's people running through the door. But it's not always the case. Um, at the moment, we're seeing in the press that it, house prices are um, are doing really well and the, um, the market is it's almost in a... A, a bubble because it's, it's it's just really good. It, it's not. <laughs> I can tell you. It's is we're seeing valuations come in and they're usually below what the customer is expecting, and they're about 10 percent below. So quite a you know a sizable amount. And we're not only just seeing the the market values come in low, but we're seeing market rents come in low now as well. And we've seen. We've got a property that was well, it's actually four properties down in South London that the market rents were they came in at a thousand pounds a month and the passing rents are actually one thousand two hundred a month. So the valuer is obviously thinking there's going to be some sort of correct correction going forward. Trying to have that discussion with a customer there then afterwards that actually it's over rented is a difficult conversation to have and there are not many valuers who change their minds so if you get a value from a a, a valuer i would 99 percent of the time say you will not change their mind whatever information you provide if you, we provided 10 comparables on this transaction that the market rent came in below the passing rent. And there was always a reason why it was a slightly different type of property or slightly different area, whatever it may be. But it's very, very difficult to change a valuer's mind. So do your research early. Make sure you've got your facts and figures on hand and that you know what they're, they're going to be and don't over egg what you think a value is going to be because it'll be you that comes out uh, you know unstuck in the end because another thing to mention is it, it doesn't happen so much with the, the the challenges but especially with the high street lenders they'll put loan to value and um debt service covenants on your loan and at any time it usually says in your your loan offer that a lender can request a valuation of a property and a lot of the time they request that and it's at the cost of the the customer the customer still has to pay for that new valuation themselves but if they do that and you've over inflated the the value of the property day one and it's you know taken a bit of a hit further down the line then you can be in breach of your covenants so it's important that you're not only thinking about the value day one but you're thinking about the value further along the line and where the market may go. Mm. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, a couple of things to go off on that. I was going to try and make a, a reference to um, value as a, a VAR system. You know, you should go over to the monitor and have a look at it because we were talking, to, you know, both like a bit of football. I can also see a John Barnes photo. Uh, for those that are listening to the podcast, yeah. you won't see it, but there's a that lifting was. the old Division 1 trophy, I think. So you must be a Liverpool fan. That was, that, that was 1989 
uh, a 1989-90 season, yeah. Last, uh, I think that was actually at Derby, that picture was taken. Liverpool won one nil, And uh, I think straight after that, we signed Mark Wright as well from Derby. He must have had a good game. So, yeah, John Barnes, one of my heroes. Uh, he's a great, great player, talented, talented. It's a great point. Yeah, yeah do your homework, do your due diligence. And I also find the it's interesting what you say about a bubble because I do think that some people at the moment, I mean, we're, you know, I hate to date stamp stuff. We're, you know, we're recording this in November, episodes out in November. And some people just seem to be absolutely ignorant about what's going on uh, in a macroeconomic sense. But I have noticed that more people have started to say, oh, hang on a minute, there's a bit of a bubble here. And, you know, mm, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, but if you look at your history of economics, there's probably only one way this is going to go in the short term, not the mm. long term. So it's interesting that you raise that point from uh, someone yeah. within the finance industry. So I, uh, I didn't study economics or anything like that at university. I actually studied history. And um, one of the people who actually popped up in my history degree was, uh, was Keynes. And your Keynes theory about your, your 12 to 16 year cycle of um, how the economy goes up and down. And it happens all the time. You know, it, it, you can see throughout history, if you look back, you will see that there's been peaks and troughs in the economy. And another thing he also mentions is about the only way to get out of economic distress is to stimulate the economy. And that's exactly what the government are doing. They, in the past, you know, it wasn't so um, much of a prevalent idea, but now the government really are trying to stimulate the economy and keep house, you know, the, the stamp duty um, um, holiday has been very well received and kept the market going. But it's, it's really interesting that it, it is cyclical. And what's going to happen next year is a, a big question. Quarter one, quarter two is where I see, and I've said this um over the last, well, probably since lockdown, March, April time, is where we're going to see the, the big problems, in my opinion. It's almost like a perfect storm's coming. You've got um, potential end to the stamp duty holiday. You've got the end of furlough. You've got the end of the C-bills scheme, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. You've got the... Brexit situation and also you've also got to think that especially commercial landlords mm -hmm. they may be able to take a hit for one or maybe two quarters payments and usually commercial investments have quarterly payments it's just the way that it's usually done so it's not probably until your third or fourth payment is going to be missed by a tenant that it's really going to hit home so I think quarter one, quarter two is where we're going to see something. The government can't continue to prop up the economy. And if you also think about somebody's got to repay this government stimulus in the future. I saw something interesting the other day. that It wasn't until something like I think it was 1984 that the government repaid their debt from World War II. I think we've put a lot more money, I, uh, this is a, a guess here, but I presume we've put a lot more money into this than we did World War II. You know, I, th I, I would suggest that the, the figures are you know, massive now. Um, so I just think it's, it's something that we need to bear in mind that there is going to be a downturn and the government can't keep doing it. So it'd be interesting, quarter one, quarter two next year, I think it's where we're really going to see something. It sounds like we should have a follow-up episode maybe at some point in 2021 on that. I've just been nodding, as you can see, in, in, in the background. Because that's, I know I've said it throughout the last half hour, you know, everything you say, I'm just sat here and agreeing. And I'm, I'm like a nodding donkey. But I completely and utterly agree with everything. Because it's, yeah, all you got to do is, you know, a little bit of homework, a little bit of looking at stuff. And, and that's what I believe is going to happen. It's, you know, there's this little bubbles being created, whether it's intentional or not. And, you know, Keynesian economics is good for a couple of things. It can be quite flawed, depending on your view, I suppose. But um, yeah. I, I su we have to also, you have to also remember just one quick point: we do live in a capitalist society. It does go up, it does go go down. You're going to have rich people, you're going to have poor people. It's it's the way the world works, and capitalism corrects itself. We could be seeing 
that capitalist, you know, big brush coming to sweep a few people up, unfortunately. As you say, it's, it's, it's how the world works, isn't it? It's, we, we need that to, to create that balance in, in the long run. Well, Mark, so just to, just to summarise here then, so if, if we're narrowing this down to the three key points that you've mentioned in today's episode about how people can help themselves, number one is have a good power team that knows each other. Number two would be be prepared for your application. Uh, so work with your broker on that. And then number three would be to do your due diligence in the property itself and the area. And then you should hopefully find that that will help to facilitate things moving forward. Yes, exactly that. I think that's a, a good summary. There's other little things you can do here and there, but those three things will put you in good stead. And this, you know, it's not rocket science. It, anything in life, put yourself around good people, prepare well, do your homework. You'll be all right. Don't worry. It's, you know, you do that, you'll be okay. Lovely stuff. Well, uh, Mark, just want to say a, 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 big, a massive thank you to yourself. How can people get in touch with you? They can either email me at mark at wharffinancial.co.uk, and that's Mark with a C, or we're all over social media, which is at Wharf Financials with an S on the end. Lovely. And as usual, we'll put all the links to that in the show notes. Mark, a great really 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 good stuff there i really enjoyed that massive thank you and maybe we should have a a follow-up in 2021 to see uh, the state of play that'd be excellent thank you